We are here at the European Society of Cardiology meetings in Paris, France, and I'm incredibly delighted to uh, be able to introduce uh, myself, Ivor Benjamin, immediate past president of the American Heart Association, and my colleague and friend, Dr. Bob Harrington, president of the American Heart Association. Uh, Bob, we're going to review some amazing science yeah, we sure that are. actually, um, you know, came out um, today. And I think that, you know, we have obviously picked a few, but uh, why not tell us a little bit more about FEMAS? Well, I mean, it's been a great day, and this is truly hot off the press. These trials were literally just presented in the last hour. And, uh, and the three we're going to talk about are FEMAS, FEMAS yeah. PCI, yeah. and DAPA HF. You got it. Uh, and these are really important and interesting, Ivor, I think, because they, all of the trials involve drugs which are commonly used. And mm -hmm. so these are potentially practice-changing or at least practice-influencing, yeah. and we should be able to think about them immediately. So let's okay. talk about Themis first. So you bet. Uh, in, in full disclosure, I was an investigator in, in Themis, was a member of the executive committee, and uh, it involved a uh, antiplatelet drug called Ticagrelor. Mm -hmm. I was also the... Uh, mm -hmm the co-investigator of the big Plato study with uh, Ticagrelor, yeah. which actually we presented at these meetings 10 years ago. Wow. At this, uh, at this and meeting. there's still more work to be done. And there's still more work to be done. That was part of the point, is that <laughs> there has been a tremendous amount we've learned about using Ticagrelor. It's yes. a P2I12 inhibitor, yes. as you know, used in people with coronary disease, undergoing stenting, mm -hmm. people with acute coronary syndromes. Mm -hmm. In Themis, what we were interested in is in the group of patients with diabetes, mm -hmm. so a high-risk group of patients mm -hmm. clinically, who have had coronary disease but are at the point of stability, so mm -hmm. stable coronary stable disease, coronary disease. Uh -huh. um, many if not most of those people are just on aspirin. Does the addition of ticagrelor to their medical regimen improve outcome relative to placebo? Okay. Big trial. Important question. Important question because it's a big group of patients. Over 19,000 patients randomized, mm -hmm. followed for uh, over three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So big population, studied for a long period of time, mm -hmm. good adherence to the study medication, mm -hmm. and what was observed. A modest benefit mm -hmm. of Ticagrelor, and by modest we need you know, 13, 15% range okay. relative, and um, statistically significant mm -hmm. on reducing the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, but that came also with an increased risk of bleeding. And so you have a modest benefit, an increased risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it from a net clinical benefit perspective, mm -hmm. there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. You're trading off a little bit of bleeding for, um, uh, for that little bit of ischemic benefit. But as part of the Themis study, we we're particularly interested in asking the question, mm -hmm. what about the group of patients who underwent PCI in the past, who we know took dual antiplatelet therapy for some period of time. So just to set it up, we're, we're talking about risk-benefit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 in, and in acute coronary disease, as you know, right. it's very definable. Yeah, you got it. The, the benefit is preventing ischemic events. Mm -hmm. The risk is causing bleeding. You got it. And how do you weigh those oh, two? You got it. So in, the, in, in Themis PCI, this was a pre-stated hypothesis mm -hmm. of the larger study. Yeah. What about those patients that got into Themis mm -hmm. as evidence that they had had coronary disease because they'd had a prior PCI? Mm -hmm. And we know that those patients might be different than patients who didn't get a PCI. Sure enough. We also know that they probably tolerated DAPT at some point. At some point, absolutely. So yeah. of that 19,000, over 11,000 of those patients had had a prior PCI. So big sample. Big samples. Big trial so, by So itself. we ought to be really be able to um, having some level of confidence. Exactly. And, and particularly when you look at the, the two together. Mm -hmm. And here we see something different than we see in the overall trial. And the mm -hmm. overall trial is a modest effect. Mm -hmm. When you look at the patients with prior PCI, bigger effect, still a modest increased risk of bleeding, mm -hmm. but now you see net clinical benefit. There More you go. benefit than risk. There you go. And so I think for me, wrapping that all together, it says that in the group of patients who have stable coronary disease mm -hmm. and who have had a prior PCI, mm -hmm. that population has, it has diabetes, and ha that, that population has a risk attached to it that the longer term administration of dual antiplatelet therapy ought to be considered. Yes. And Ivor, I think we can put this in the context of things like the Pegasus trial, yep. uh, the DAPT trial, which looked at long-term dual antiplatelet therapy, sure. that there is a high-risk group of patients, 
and utilizing risk scores can be helpful, utilizing prior PCI or not in the face of diabetes can be helpful, but certain patients should get consideration for prolonged dual and I think, And I think that's, that's the main point that you're really getting at. That's it's right. that subset of patients, and we've got to really be able to do randomized trials with sufficient confidence that you've got the numbers to be able to, with some degree, and I would suspect that this will even get into guidelines at some future point. Well, I think this is the kind of trial that guidelines will certainly consider. As, a, uh, as one of the investigators, as I said <laughs> at the outside, I, I, I would hope that these are the kind of data that the guideline writers will evaluate and, mm -hmm. uh, and take into consideration when they're thinking about who do we treat with long-term dual mm -hmm. plate therapy. So, so, so the management of patients with ischemic heart disease continues to evolve, and it's that complementary vascularization plus an uh, antiplatelet therapy. And always assessing risk for both ischemic events and bleeding. So if you have somebody who's at high ischemic risk mm -hmm. and low bleeding, mm -hmm. then you might have a little more confidence to use aggressive therapy. That's right. You have somebody very high bleeding risk, not so high ischemic risk, avoid them makes good sense to me and I think that this is going to be impactful for many of our patients and like you said, something for future guidelines uh, committees to consider. Let's talk a little bit about DAPA-HF. Yeah, DAPA-HF I think may have been the highlight of the day. Okay. Because uh, uh, a Just couple remind of our viewers about DAPA itself. Yeah, so uh, uh, dapagliflozin is a, a drug, so-called SGL2 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. These were drugs developed for the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes. Yes. And they were developed in the setting of um, FDA guidance on the development of diabetes agents where we knew that they lower blood sugar, mm -hmm. we knew that they help control hemoglobin A1C, yeah. a, 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 hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. what we don't know is how safe they are. And as you know well, there have been a series of diabetic drugs which raise the risk of cardiac disease, cardiac events. And so the FDA a number of years ago put into place large-scale studies to really demonstrate that the drugs were not only good at improving blood sugar, mm -hmm. but cardiac risk. Could they understand it? So a number of large trials were done, and with the SGL2 inhibitors, something interesting emerged. Yes. Not only might there be um, benefit or, or lack of harm of uh, the SGL2 inhibitors, there may actually be cardiac benefit. That's this, a profound statement, and, uh, and we didn't expect that at the outset. It, th this is fascinating because when you sort of think about the biology yes. of actually where the SGLT2 is, that cardiovascular effect might not be cardiac specific. That's correct. <laughs> that, that's correct. And it may not be diabetes specific. You got it. And, and that was the interesting thing about yeah. DAPA HF is that they took a group of patients with heart failure, mm -hmm. um, many of whom had diabetes, but not all. Yep. And they, they were really looking to say, with this diabetes treatment, could you improve outcome in heart failure? Wow, that's kind of a bold question. That is an important question. A really important question, and really makes the case for the power of observation, is to really keep in mind, as you said, the biology, the mechanism, and think about not just the fact that it lowers blood sugar, but might it have other benefits in patients with cardiovascular disease, in this case, heart failure. And I, I would say um, I bought, this trial was a home run. They demonstrated that there was a big reduction wow. in, uh, in the combination of heart failure, hospitalization, or mortality, and there was an effect on mortality, which we don't often see in, uh, in these trials. And this was on top of aggressive medical therapy for heart failure with things like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers widely used. And, and, and obviously this family of drugs also have implications both not only for cardiac events but even hospitalizations. Yes. I mean you think overall cost of just managing patients with chronic heart failure. Yeah, I, I think that's well said as we think about the whole quality of life, cost effectiveness, clinical outcomes, in this particular trial, it all fits together nicely. And I think that uh, it was an exciting trial result. Uh, it's being shared widely with the, with the world today. And, uh, and this is something that I'm sure that people will want to read the papers when they come out uh, with great interest. Well, you know, Bob, this speaks, um, I think, eloquently to what you just now mentioned. Um, it was observations in the laboratory. <laughs> Yes. That then obviously, you know, evolved into new therapeutics that actually have real-world benefits, especially when you think about the burden of heart failure, not only in the United States, but globally. Yeah. It's quite substantial. 
and to really have drugs that be considered game changers in the management of patients who have systemic diseases, multi-system disease, and not to mention, of course, you know, additional populations who may have, for example, renal disease. Yeah, and, and this one in particular was fascinating because here's an anti-diabetic agent. You say, okay, it improves heart failure outcomes in patients with diabetes. I get that. No, no, no. It improves the outcomes in patients both with and without diabetes, and that to me is fascinating. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, Bob and I obviously can keep going on reporting here from uh, ESC 2019, but thank you so very much, Bob, and uh, we look forward to additional studies that might be coming along uh, at these meetings. I look forward to talking with you again, Ivor. You bet.